I left school at about 16. And I didn't know really, like most kids do, what you want to do when you leave school. And I was always obsessed with dyeing my hair. So I thought I'd become a hairdresser. And at that time, I think I had like a rockabilly haircut, sort of quiff, but it had a quiff and it was cropped at the back. It was bleached white with a blue quiff and a blue music note in the back. And I wrote off to all these uh, big hairdressing companies like I was told to do, to go and get these jobs. And I knew full well no one would employ me. And uh, a very famous hairdresser at that time was Vidal Sassoon. And I wrote the uh, letter to Vidal Sassoon and I got an interview, which I couldn't believe. So I had all my sort of, it was after punk, sort of punk going into rockabilly look. And I just thought, I'm just gonna go there, you know, and wear what I normally wear. I definitely won't get the job, so it doesn't matter. Well, when I turned up to this interview, which was over in the, uh, in the West End, in Brook Street, I think it was, this, it dawned on me what I was going to. And there was all these kids from America who turned up for this interview. They'd specially flown in. Everyone's killing themselves to get this job. And I was in the queue and I thought, well, I might as well stay here because I've got to tell my mum that I've done it. And I went there and they interviewed you like in a rotor system and I sat down. They were really nice to love my hair. I thought, oh, this is great, you know. And I just talked like I'm talking now, just being myself. And uh, I couldn't believe it. I got the job. And when I turned up, it was great thing to see something that's always been with me. It was all the kids that were a bit weird and out there. All these really straight kids had come from and they'd had training in this and they'd done that. They didn't get in there because they were looking for creative people. And so that was one of my, when I started work, I suppose. So how uh, did you go from that into... Sorry? How did you go from that into... Well, I, in that time, it was like, I suppose, an explosion in youth culture. There was so much going on. In the end, with that job, uh, it was really hard work. I didn't feel like I was getting anywhere, and I had too much of a social life, which was, I was a bit too young to go into that. And I was out all the time. I was going to gigs or clubs or everything like that. And... Um, and that's what I did, I suppose, for about 10 years. And I was just like a sponge. I was absorbing it all. I loved everything. I loved the atmosphere. It was uh, very hedonistic. Not really that druggy, the scene that I was in, but it did pick up later. But the beginning of it, you just do speed. And you'd only do speed so you can make the most of everything. You don't want to go to sleep because you'd miss out. So you start on a Thursday night and go through to a Sunday. And then I had sort of, my dad was a, uh, well, painter and decorator, I suppose, really. But we used to have some fantastic jobs in places like Knightsbridge and everything. So I used to work with him, get paid really well, which paid for my clothes. And my weekly wage went on my clothes and then I had a little bit for going out, but I never paid to get in anywhere because I knew everyone. And, and that was how it was. And I, I had a fantastic time. And then going from that, I got into, later on into the motorbike scene. I really liked motorbikes. Was that a connection? Well, it was a connection because I had so many motorcycle jackets and I had such a, a motorcycle look, like a brand owned. Thing that I was obsessed with. Well, the only next thing to do was get a motorbike. So I got into motorbikes, which I'm still into, and that was in my late 20s. And um, from all that clubbing kind of thing, I, I, the scene changed. What I was involved in was a very a clique. 
about 200 people. What happened was Acid House happened and it turned into everyone. I didn't run really into that, you know. So I got into the motorbike thing, but I was always into clothes. Spent a lot of time going to markets, buying clothes. I was in a world of my own. I liked vintage clothes before that word even existed. And from there, I ended up doing a market store. Well, on the market store in Portobello, when I was doing that, it was a very specialist market and people looking for certain things. And you can only use the knowledge you know. And I know all about the punk stuff, the vintage stuff, Vivian Westwood, Malcolm McLaren, seditionaries. And I started dealing in that. And that uh, catapulted into something else. And people don't realise in the sort of, this is the early 90s, Portobello was an incredible place to find clothes. And I was, people who were buying off me were people like John Paul Gaultier, Kate Moss. They were all coming down looking for these old Westwood, old Friedman pieces. So that was the, uh, that got me into clothes. Then I started designing. Then I had my own company. And then it's just gone on and on and on. And that's what I do. Well, it was the first thing I ever come across. Yeah. I was a kid, and then I was becoming a teenager. And just as I was becoming a teenager, punk happened. And what I liked about it, because I'm dyslectic, so school was just a joke. I was there because I had to be. They, and they, you're considered stupid back then and uh, not worth bothering with. So I was okay, fuck you. And then punk was saying, fuck you. And I thought, well, I found my people. And that was it. And I'd never looked back. And what from that, I loved the style, everything about it, but also the attitude that came from punk was, um, when I was younger, I used to get, take these people's opinions on. And punk taught me to basically tell them to fuck off. I actually knew more then as a 13, 14 year old kid than the adults I was talking to. And I still believe that now. They really were just in a, I was in a different place to them, totally. And I, I don't I, I still don't like being dictated to or told what to do. And, and that uh, can lead to quite a lot of problems. So, did you grow up in London? Yes, South London, Battersea. Well, quite good for the punk thing because the King's Road was just across Chelsea Bridge, so I could literally walk there. So that's why I got so involved. Yeah. Do you think Sorry. No, I think it's completely different now. I mean, I grew up and the older lot, my brother, who's, uh, you know, 10 years older than me, they were sort of caught the end of mod and skinhead and suedehead. And those, that mentality still existed and I grew up in that mentality. And you had to have the right clothes. That's it. And I don't know if that exists so much now as kids, but it was almost like we were indoctrinated about a way that you were. You had the best clothes, you were, and I come from, from that. It's all about clothes, you know, and uh, which turns into, a, where I was concerned, a bit of an obsession. If someone had the wrong clothes on when I was a kid, you didn't even talk to them. That's it. And other things like that. So it really is, uh, well, that's me. That's what it is, yes, yeah, yeah. So what's the story behind you getting involved with Pride and Well, I collected, in the end, 
I collected so many leather jackets. I was into leather jackets. And I really wanted to... Uh, some of the jackets I had were so fantastic. And I had some really good Pride and Clark ones. And not a lot of people knew about Pride and Clark. They knew about other leather brands of the 60s and 50s, and 60s, but not about that one. And I just, I thought I'm gonna start making them. So I started doing those jackets and doing things related to that because I wanted to do a motorbike sort of collection look. So I did, I did Pride and Clark. And then I started, you know, uh, it was actually my girlfriend told me, she said, why don't you do your own label? Just Dave Carroll. I never even thought about it. No one would buy it. Did it, people buy it. And so I started doing that because it didn't quite fit into the Pride and Clark thing. And then uh, as I was growing up with the punk going to the Westwood Seditionaries shop, there was also a um, another shop in Battersea, this weird shop that sold all this leather stuff, which transpires was gay. I didn't even know what gay was then and the studded belts like these, you know, and you could only get it in that shop. I didn't know anywhere else to buy it. Later on you could. And I knew the guy in there, and then he said, well, I make all the stuff for the Sex Pistol and everything. And then I started getting leather trousers made, belts, everything like that. And that was, and my mum actually worked for them as well, which was quite uh, funny, making stuff for them because they had used all the factory workers in Battersea to make their stuff. And it just came from there. And then later on, I realised how important it was in culture, punk, gay history, everything, that I started doing it again. So I, I bought the label and uh, I'm making it now. Sorry? No, no, never saw them. There's only, no, uh, very few people did. They were banned. And then they split up very early. No, I didn't see. I saw everything else. You know, Susie and the Banshees. What's your highlight? The best gig I ever went to was Adam the Ants in 1979 at the Lyceum in the Strand. That was incredible. That's where <laughs> sort of art, music, and fashion met. Incredible, life changing. Do you say that art, music, and fashion like, it's, it's like, You've got to speak up. Do you say that art, music, and fashion are like the three most important? When I grew up, they were because you had. I, and I, it came from, really for me from the Malcolm McLaren Sex Pistols scene. You had an artist doing all the record covers and artwork. You had all the clothes that came from the shop. And then you had the band. So all these things met and were perfect together. And that was then. Music, I think now, is gone a different way. I think art's gone a different way and music's gone a different way. They don't really connect anymore, which is a shame because when they do, it's incredible, incredible. But I don't think that really happens now. Do you think yeah. it will? I don't know. I honestly don't know. Do you think it's so I, Eventually, because things always come round again, I think that idea might come back again. But at that time, and especially how I felt and kids felt and the looks and everything, it obviously had a very big impression and it was quite beautiful to see it all working together. What do you think of modern home? Do you listen to modern Fine, it's not. I don't, think, I don't think so, no. No, no it's not. All punks about being new. Yeah. You know, and that it's... Uh, I mean, if people like it, great, but I don't really. Do you remember the first time you ever listened to a punk song? Yes. What song was it? 
first time I went when I was about 13 to a youth club on my own. I'd never been to one before. And that's when I met these kids. And they all had short hair. Most kids had long hair, straight trousers. And they're saying, you want to listen to this? And they said, you know, they won't let us play the music here. And I went round to this kid's house and uh, he played Nevermind the Bollocks. That. And he said, uh, they got shot on King's Road, they all go to. And, that. and I went down there and that was, I was gone. That was it, fantastic. So I remember that. And Generation X, that was one of the first things I heard. Really exciting, really fucking exciting. So that's where I, I got into it all. I've always steer cleared of politics and it really wasn't my yeah. cup of tea. It wasn't that political. It was about telling everyone to fuck off, whatever they were into, politically or otherwise. I did not give a fuck about anything. Shot back as well, isn't Yes, very much so. I absolutely love that. That's. That's the one that I've it's, it's, it's like an old saying, that, a really good saying. If it's not upsetting anyone or annoying anyone, it ain't worth doing. That's punk. You know, if you're not, you know, people these days get offended by everything, I think that's fantastic. Because you can wind them up something, they get offended by anything on social media. And it's, I have to hold my back, self back sometimes because I love it. I love offending people, it's great. But so the only way anyone moves forward is by questioning everything. Everyone goes along talking, being the same. Where do you get stuck in the past? Well, you get stuck in a sort of meal where you're just a load of robots. Education yeah. and, and work. Yeah. Well, work's completely changed because of computers and, you know, the workplace is not the workplace in the 80s. <coughs> and the education system in this country in the 1970s and 80s was appalling. It really was dreadful. And I realised that by the time I was about eight. That's why I never entered into it. Well, some people you can't, they can't mould you, you know, and um, I was just, I didn't know what they were talking about anyway, so, but the, the, the education was dreadful, absolutely dreadful. Do you think you might not have got into the punk movement so much in the way you are now without having such a shared experience? Sorry? Do you think that you would uh, still be where you are now if you had a good education? Yes. 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 You would have found the same people, the same community that it gave you. Yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I went somewhere where your education or your lack of education didn't matter. We were on a different plane. We knew more than everyone, and that was it. You know, we, it's a diff, two different worlds. So they're all different worlds. These things. You know, and it's finding your way to where you want to be, you know, and it doesn't mean you have to be like everyone else. Do you think it's hard to be individual? Yeah, very hard. Very hard, yes. I think that's why, like you were saying, how modern punk isn't the same and how music isn't as impactful as it once was. It's because it's so, you either don't want to be the same as everyone else, but like, it's just so, like you said, it's so hard to be original. It's hard to be original, but with a punk ethic, the closest I think you get to it now, mm. I suppose, is grime music. Yeah. That's punk rock. That's mm. kids doing doing it themselves, you know, and uh, not part of the mainstream, mm -hmm. you know.
and no one's telling them they can do it and they can't do it. They're just sitting in their bedroom and they're fucking doing it, which is great. That, that, I suppose that's... Yes. My two, I've got two sons, and they're not really into music. Really? They're oh. just into yeah, Quite close. yeah. Well, one of them likes grime, and whatever it's called. He likes that kind of music, but no, they're more into film and computers and things like that. They're not really. I think they work quite hand in hand, the music and film. Yeah. I, I, for me, it does. Yes, yes, yeah. I don't know if it's for younger people. Uh, they like clothes, but they're, I think they're a bit sick about hearing about it, having me around them, right. you know, <laughs> which is all I talk about. Because you don't want to do what your dad does, you know. <laughs> it's not cool. So if you had any really, like, um, period of time that you had to do really shit work? Oh, yes. I've done that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Was that during the 80s? Uh... Yeah, lots of crap jobs in the 80s. But I didn't really mind it because it wasn't my focus. It was to get money, to buy clothes, to go out, to enjoy myself and have a fantastic time. And also I joined a band and we got a record deal. And what was the first band you joined then? The first band I joined was the Pocket Rockets that got signed. I was just said they asked me, uh, MCA United Artists. Yeah, so uh, that was quite an experience. Yeah, what was the experience of getting signed? Getting signed, it was a double edged sword. It was fantastic, but at the same time, it was we become a product for a corporate agency to sell something. I wanted to be, and it was completely off, you know, but there you go, that's, that's what happens, you know. Did they try and uh, mediate your work control them? Yeah, and they told us what to wear. Oh, wow. They told them to fuck off, and that was it, I was out. Yeah. Oh, they really, uh, <coughs> perhaps I should have kept my mouth shut and done what I was told, and I would have earned a load of money, but really? I was 21. I'd never done it. When I the, see things, I don't know if they happen now to kids. Met someone in a nightclub. Can you sing? Yes, I can sing. And I was out of my box. I could never sing in my life. Went down. He said, "Oh, you're okay. You've got to have singing lessons." I thought, "Well, why? Well, oh, we're going on tour in a month." <laughs> okay. I got swept up in that childish thing of how bands work and it's all fantastic clothes and you go here and you go there and it's all <coughs> like a dream so I've done singing lessons I've done rehearsals then I got on a coach it was big audio dynamite and we used Mick Jones from The Clash and I, and I was awestruck this all is fantastic time. sorry all on the same, on the same wow. coach and then I turned up in Liverpool place called Liverpool Empire, which is huge. That was great, get off there. And then we got fed, we got a dressing room, and it never hit me. And then they said, you're on in five minutes. We were on, we're on in five minutes. Sounds strange. <coughs> I was in denial. I slept on stage, two and a half thousand people. Packed. I'd never sung. But you had singing lessons? No, yeah, I had singing lessons, I'd sung in rehearsals, I'd done it. I'd never done a gig. What was it like? Fucking terrifying, I froze. And the guitarist started playing, came up, nudged me, he said, fucking sing. And so when I started singing, we had another singer as well. And then it went, uh, we went down great. And it was fantastic. And I thought, oh, this is why people do this. It, the buzz was amazing. And then we carried on through the tour. We'd done one tour, we got a manager, signed by a manager. Then we'd done the second tour, we got a record deal. So it happened very, very quickly, you know? And that was... 
I was doing one thing, and all of a sudden, my world had changed overnight. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's an amazing experience. So you got more into the actual textiles side of it? Yes, I, uh, uh, I'm more into design and fabrics and coming up with taking things and making them new, basically. And giving them a twist on them. And that's what I really do. Yeah. It's, only, it's only for a five minute film. Oh, well. Oh. Do you reckon you have lots of like pictures and stuff of you like performing? Uh, like I've got, if you need stuff, I can get you some stuff. Oh, yeah. 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 Quite nice if you can. yeah, I'll try and find it. So most of it's, sorry? Uh, yeah, there's a record. There's a record out. I haven't got it actually. But you can get it on eBay. Really? Yeah, oh, yeah. Twelve-inch remix and everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's That's fucking cool. terrible. Sorry. Before. Uh, no, that was after. Before it got worse. But I did. Uh, I joined another band after that. That was a hard rock band. And that was pretty good as well. I can send you some of that. Yeah, that'd be yeah. Cool. yeah. Any pictures, anything? anything. That'd be cool. It's good because the audio record is the most powerful. So is that. 